This week on ANN, the Seventh day Adventist Church's executive committee starts their annual spring meetings. Adventist Church leaders vote to hold a special general conference session in January. And we hear a financial report from the Adventist Church treasurer. These stories and more coming up. Thank you so much for joining us this week. First in the news, on Tuesday, April 13, members of the General Conference Executive Committee, or GCXCOM, of the Seventh-day Adventist Church voted to hold a special General Conference session on January 18, 2022. The vote took place on the opening day of the 2021 Spring Meetings, one of the two annual business meetings of the denomination's top governing body between World Session. This year's meeting took place virtually due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The special one-day, one-item GC session, which will be live-streamed and held at the World Church Headquarters in the U.S. state of Maryland, is being called for the sole purpose of amending the GC Constitution to allow delegates to participate by digital means in a future GC session in the event that unforeseen and unavoidable circumstances arise. Adventist Church Undersecretary Hensley Muroven detailed some of the factors considered in presenting this proposal to the GCXCOM members. He reminded listeners that the church's constitution stipulates that GC sessions must take place in person and on site. Additionally, Article 5, Section 1 of the Constitution states that postponing a GC session should not exceed two years beyond a regularly scheduled date. Maruvin then explained that amendments to the GC Constitution and bylaws can only be done by the delegates at a regular or special GC session. General Conference President Ted N.C. Wilson also confirmed that the special GC session would meet for one agenda item only. He assured members that the special session would not add any agenda items dealing with theological or missological proposals. As the global COVID-19 pandemic continues to challenge large gatherings and travel, GC administrators, though planning for an in-person GC session June 6 through the 11th, 2022, in St. Louis, Missouri, felt it prudent to work on a supplementary solution. After the initial session postponement, the Constitution and Bylaws Committee met and recommended an amendment to the GC Constitution, which would allow for the possibility of virtual attendance in the future. However, the possibility of another delay because of the ongoing worldwide impact of the pandemic would put the General Conference out of compliance with its governing document. Church leadership recommended that it would be advantageous if a special GC session was called for the sole purpose of amending the Constitution, which would provide for a virtual or hybrid GC session. In 2020, a meeting of the GCXCOM already voted to propose an amendment to the GC Constitution that would allow for virtual participation when specifically requested by the Executive Committee. The committee would still have to make a decision at the appropriate time based on the then circumstances, whether the GC session would be held virtually, in person, or a hybrid of the two. The spring meeting GC XCOM also voted to reduce the total number of regular and at-large delegates to the January special GC session to 400 people for this specific meeting. The allocated quota of delegates for the GC, 13 divisions, and two attached unions was approved as well. The motion included a request that divisions unable to send their allotted quota of delegates due to travel restrictions or other reasons be allowed to reallocate their unused quota back to the GC. The GC Administrative Committee would then designate these positions to individuals currently working at the GC headquarters, primarily from the divisions which shared their quota. A final element in the voted motion was to request all 13 world divisions and 137 union executive committees to discuss and vote on the proposal with a report back to the GC Secretariat by August 31st, 2021. After discussion, three motions passed with overwhelming majority support. The first motion to approve the special general conference session proposal was approved by a vote of 169 to 3. The second motion to convene a special general conference session on January 18, 2022 in Silver Spring, Maryland, United States, for the purpose of amending the general conference constitution to allow for electronic participation at general conference session was approved 168 to 3. 
The final motion to reduce the total number of regular and at-large delegates to the January 18, 2022 Special General Conference session to 400 was also approved by a margin of 170 to 1. Although the global economic turmoil caused by the continual COVID-19 pandemic also struck the General Conference of Seven-Day Adventist Finances, God's provision and astute actions by church leadership kept the world headquarters solvent and serving. Adventist church treasurer Juan Prestol Poisson told the delegates during the 2021 spring meetings that things are different and the world in general and the church in particular are still in a survival mode. We are doing new things and we are learning to do old things in a different way. Confronted with a near total shutdown of business activity across the many nations in which the world church has members, Prestol Poisson recalled that leaders said in the early part of 2020, that we might show a 20 million operating loss by the end of the fiscal year. And prayers were offered hoping for divine intervention. Those prayers were answered more generously than I thought, he said. Instead of breaking even, the general conference's net assets without donor restrictions grew by 67,816 US dollars. He added liquidity and operating levels previously reported below adequate levels ended 2020 at an adequate level due to the lower expense level. During the year, the general conference reduced personnel, eliminated services and avoided unnecessary costs. That lower expense level was not achieved without pain. Positions were cut at the world headquarters and some services were trimmed or eliminated. In the 2021, the general conference expects to be in a catch up mode. But Estor Poisson also took pains to note that the 2020 fiscal year left us plenty of warning against careless management and cautioned us about being overconfident in 2021 and beyond. But Estor Poisson said he expects a worldwide manifestation of giving guided by the Holy Spirit, when funds will be given in the largest amount we will ever see, the funding needed for the concluding effort to reach humanity before the close of probation. Also during the Treasurer's Report, Under Treasurer Ray Wallen noted 2020 ended up a far different year than was expected. The General Conference or GC started off 2020 with an approved in-house budget of slightly more than 50 million US dollars. With the sudden changes happening in the early months of the year, the GC took measured steps to reduce its operational budget. These actions taken in the second quarter of the year had the effect of reducing the operating budget to $46.6 million. Trimming expenses proved to be a wise move given that tithe income for the GC decreased by 3% in 2020 or 2.7 million US dollars. Contributing factors were an already planned reduction in the North American division's tithe percentage from 6.1% to 5.85%, and sharp devaluations in the currencies of Brazil and Mexico. Those two countries are part of division supplying half the world's church's foreign currency income. Brazil is part of the South American division and Mexico in the Inter-American division. According to Wallen, when comparing 2019 to 2020, one can see that the 29.9 million US dollar decrease in income was offset by reducing expenses 17.1 million and shifting transfers by 7.1 million. This provided a bottom line that was 5.7 million less than 2019, but still slightly more than break even for the year. World mission offerings, Wallen said, presented a different picture. In 2020, those offerings dropped by 20% from 2019. Wallen said, this area of giving merits urgent comprehensive study to determine the causes, such as the possibility of changing attitudes regarding donations to missions and the need for giving opportunities that disappear when on-site worship services are canceled, Wallen noted. You can read the full treasury report on Adventist.news. Treasurer of the Adventist Church, Juan Prestol Poisson, formally announced his retirement just prior to the annual spring meetings. But Estor Poisson has served as chief financial officer for the Seventh-day Adventist Church since July 2015. A native of the Dominican Republic, Prestor Poisson began his long legacy of service for the denomination in 1969 as an accountant for his local conference. 
For five years, he worked as treasurer for the North Dominican Mission before he moved to Berrien Springs, Michigan to pursue his Master's of Business Administration at Andrews University. Upon the completion of his degree, he served first as treasurer for the Greater New York Conference, then treasurer of the Atlantic Union Conference, followed by a term of service in the Euro-Asian Division. Bresol Puesan and his family relocated to Maryland in 1996, where he first became associate treasurer, then treasurer of the North American Division. He joined the General Conference as under treasurer in 2007. Throughout his tenure, Prestor Puesan has continually pointed the church and its leaders to dependence upon God's guidance and protection in financial situations. A consummate professional, he has been a careful, ethical, mission-minded leader focused on advancing God's kingdom even through challenging times. Recognizing Prestor Puesan and his service, Ted N.C. Wilson, president of the General Conference, said, Thank you so much for your amazing contribution to God's work over many, many years, decades. What a privilege that you and I have had the opportunity of working together in various parts of this globe, all to the glory of God. Thank you. Prestor Puesan thanked his colleagues for their support, trust, and confidence over the years. I will miss you and our camaraderie as leaders. It has been a blessing to serve alongside you and many others during my life of service. A new treasurer will be elected by the executive committee during the spring meetings with duties to begin August 1st. And we will bring that story next week. On Friday, April 9, La Soufriere, the highest mountain peak on the island of St. Vincent and the Grenadines erupted, forcing more than 20,000 people to evacuate. Ash and smoke completely filled the sky, blanketing neighborhoods and streets across the island and reaching other islands like Barbados on Saturday. The ash is expected to fall for the next few days, possibly weeks, and could reach as far as Jamaica and parts of South America, according to local officials. Officials also expect another larger eruption to occur. The Adventist Development and Relief Agency, or ADRA, is working with local authorities in the Caribbean to coordinate relief efforts. ADRA's Caribbean Union Director, Alexander Isaacs, said, We've discovered there are major gaps in basic needs, including food, water, hygiene, and cleaning kits, and personal protective equipment. The needs are widespread, and we are working round the clock to get these essential items to those impacted. ADRA has been working with local authorities and Adventist churches within the Caribbean Union to set up shelters and provide up to 200 to 300 meals a day. At least 10 Adventist schools and churches are designated as official shelters to house evacuees. Due to increasing demands, meal distributions will double over the coming days as part of the response effort. Isaac said that the eruption impacted crops and trees and shut down water supply and power lines throughout the entire island. Another concern is air quality around the island, which could impact people with respiratory issues. Another issue is having to deal with COVID-19 infections, which remains a threat to people being forced to evacuate and congregate in shelters. La Soufriere Volcano's deadliest recorded eruption occurred on May 6, 1902, killing nearly 1,600 people, according to a news report. The last eruption to occur on the island took place in April 1979 with no reported casualties. Coming up, Advent Health shares a new way to teach anatomy to students. But up next, being inside didn't stop this 76-year-old woman from serving her community. Welcome back. At age 76, Arinda Silva found an unusual way to continue expressing care for others, even while she is confined due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Silva improvised a rope to collect supplies and lower donations. The idea was born out of the retiree's need to help people who come to her asking for help. 
According to Silva, the search for food has increased with the pandemic. Silva is not new to volunteering to help others. For nearly 20 years, the retiree worked at Adventist Solidarity Action, a department of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in South America aimed at helping the community with groceries. In addition to supplies, Silva also regularly bakes loaves of bread and goes to the porch of the house to watch for anyone in need passing by. If someone doesn't need to go to Silva asking for her famous bread, she gives others loaves in exchange for foods like sugar, oil, rice, or beans, and reserves the proceeds to donate later. Silva says, I like to help so that when I am no longer here, others continue. The motivation I feel comes from God. It allows me to see the need that people have, so I do what I can to continue this work. Perguntaram o que que me motiva, né? O que que me motivou a vida inteira a fazer esse trabalho? O que me motivou mesmo foi o amor de Deus em mim. Porque o amor de Deus em mim é tão grande que eu não posso ficar só para mim. Eu preciso. A minha motivação é Jesus no meu coração. É Jesus que toca na gente, porque da gente mesmo a gente não é nada. É menos que nada até, né? Essa frase é que eu tenho na minha vida. Eu quero sempre fazer as coisas para as pessoas porque o próximo, nós precisamos amar o próximo como nós mesmos. E o próximo é todo aquele que precisa. Se ele pede, é porque ele precisa. E se ele vai aproveitar bem, aí é com ele. Ao errar, eu quero errar pelo lado da misericórdia. Advent Health University in Orlando, Florida, has introduced an innovative way to teach anatomy to students. The Anatomage table allows students using only a touch of a finger to completely dissect a cadaver virtually and more efficiently than traditional dissections. Tom Johnson brings us this report. An amazing piece of technology now helping Advent Health University teach students about the human body. Videographer David Maddox takes you on a tour of the Anatomage table. You just, you just click it? Yeah. It's very cool. So this is the Anatomage table. It's a biomedical device where you can see a human cadaver. So I can just click any structure. and It's your normal cadaver experience, but computerized. You're able to dissect structures with a touch of a finger. Let's go and um, peel the skin. Digital anatomy and virtual anatomy uh, actually has helped teaching anatomy in a much more effective way. Wow, it's a really good view. You can see the whole body. Uh, at various levels and also at the same time see the cross section and examine everything all together as a whole. When you're dissecting a real cadaver, it could take you 15, 20 minutes to dissect the structure, whereas this is just a touch of the finger. It's really a fantastic tool to actually complement learning anatomy and also applying it. I don't know if we can get to the bronchi. Oh, there we go. Some of the models on this device, it's, it's really cool. You can do sagittal cuts and transverse cuts, whether it's the spinal cord or the brain. When you are able to actually um, show everything, they learn more and you, you enjoy because you feel that, that they're learning it. Uh, this was a very good investment. I think it has really improved their learning and uh, the whole education actually is uh, easier. One of Advent Health service standards is making it easy. And this device really makes it easy to learn anatomy. It's going to benefit a lot of students. In Orlando, Tom Johnson for Advent Health. Coming up, David Trim is here with This Week in Adventist History. But up next, Adventist Mission shares the story of a young man who felt a calling to mission in China. Why is there evil in the world? 
Christians hypocrites? Is the Bible a fairy tale? Does Jesus love everyone? Church doesn't feel relevant to my life. Is God even real? You have questions? Let's talk about it. I Believe Bible. Welcome back. Arthur alum was only 19 and newly Adventist when he felt God calling him to serve in China. He decided to attend Avondale College to prepare for mission service. And there he met two people who changed his life forever. Adventist Mission has more. At only 19 years old, Arthur Allum sensed God calling him to serve in China. This was only a year after he joined the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Even though his own relationship with Jesus was still new and growing, for him, the call to go to China was just as definite as the call to keep the Sabbath. He decided to attend Avondale College to prepare for his life of mission service. At Avondale, Arthur connected with two people who would be essential in his life. The first was a young woman named Ava. She became his wife and future mission partner. Second was Dr. Harry Miller, a pioneer Adventist missionary to China. Dr. Miller wrote to Arthur and described the work there. He encouraged him to come serve as a missionary. To raise money for traveling, Arthur sold literature in New Zealand as soon as the college year was over. Arthur and Ava married only a month before they sailed to China in 1906. The couple's first assignment was working in the health clinic and printing office overseen by Dr. Miller. The Alums immediately started dressing like their new neighbors and learning to speak Mandarin. They found the new language difficult to learn, but they were determined because they knew it was critical to their mission. Day after day, they practiced until they were fluent in Mandarin. Arthur even became an interpreter. Learning a new language was only the first challenge this missionary couple faced. The second was malaria. Both became ill at one point or another and Arthur even contracted malaria three times. Still, they were committed to serving the people primarily through publishing work and education. In August 1911, Arthur reported that in the year before, the North Central China Mission had 64 church members. That number had since grown to over 100 and was still growing. Arthur said, in a work like this, there is no room for discouragement. Arthur and Eva had three boys while serving in China. <laughs> Eva stayed busy caring for her family, as well as the people they were trying to reach. She taught Sabbath school, led the Young People's Society, and held Bible studies with women twice a week. For 17 years, Arthur and Eva's family served the Chinese people. Hi. Hello. Hi. Every day they tried to share the love of Jesus with even just one person. When Arthur gave a report to the General Conference about the work in China, he highlighted the continual need for missionaries to reach those who did not know Jesus. He said, we long for power to stir the multitudes of China as they have never been stirred in days past. We are seeking with you for a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit for service. Today, the mission offerings send and equip missionaries all over the world. Your support helps the Adventist Church answer the Great Commission. Because of the mission offerings, missionaries have the opportunity to take the love of Jesus to the ends of the earth. Watch this and other mission stories online by visiting AdventistMission.org. Then click on videos at the top. And finally, for today's episode, let's turn to David Trim for a look at Adventist history. This week, a historic Adventist school opens on the U.S. West Coast, one from which many missionaries went to serve across the Pacific Ocean and Asia. Welcome to This Week in Adventist History. On April 11, 1882, Healdsburg College opened for its first term with just two teachers, one of them, this man, Sidney Brownsberger, who was also the president. Located 70 miles north of San Francisco on the U.S. West Coast, 
It was also some 30 miles from the location of the Rural Health Retreat, which today is Adventist Health St. Helena, and which Ellen G. White had founded in California five years earlier in 1877. Healdsburg was just the second Seventh-day Adventist educational institution in the world after Battle Creek College, of which Brownsburger had also been president. Ellen White took a keen interest in Healdsburg, as well as the nearby rural health retreat. Healdsburg College produced mission-minded graduates and faculty, for in 1896, its second president, William C. Granger, who had led Healdsburg for eight years, gave up the presidency to become the first Adventist missionary to Japan. Other alumni went to serve in China, Korea, and the islands of the South Pacific. Healdsburg served the church for slightly more than a quarter of a century before circumstances obliged it to close in 1908, but not for long, because in 1909, thanks to the intervention of the Pacific Union Conference, which had only been founded in 1901, the college reopened in a new location, Angwin, close to St. Helena Sanitarium, and with a new name, Pacific Union College. And under that name, it has operated ever since 1909 and still does today. On April 15, 1920, a new Adventist healthcare institution opened in Berlin, capital of Germany. The institution was then called Waldfriede Sanitarium, and it still exists today under the title Krankenhaus Waldfriede, which roughly translated means Forest Peace Hospital, though its English title is Berlin Adventist Hospital. It opened as a 39-bed sanitarium hospital under the leadership of Dr. Ludwig E. Conradi. Today, it is a 210-bed hospital that treats around 100,000 patients each year. It has long been the only acute care hospital in the inter-European division, and thus is an important institution. Please keep it and its witness in that highly secular country of Germany, in your prayers. That was this week in Seventh-day Adventist history. Thanks for watching, and then join us next week for more news from the headquarters of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Did you know the Adventist Church has a YouTube channel where you can watch ANN video, ANN in-depth, and plenty of other amazing videos on prophecy, health, and Bible study? Just go to YouTube and search for the Adventist Church click on the subscribe button to make sure you're caught up each week. And remember, leave a comment or a prayer request. We have people who are praying for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Before we say goodbye, here's some good news from the book of Daniel, chapter two, verse 44. The passage says, in the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end but it will itself endure forever. That's our program for this week. And remember, you can always visit Adventist.news for daily news and videos. Until next time, God bless. Take care.